This is lecture 13 on taxonomy. So we're going to cover the rules of tax, taxonomic nomenclature, the basic rules um, as you should use them in biology courses, and also the concept of phylogenetic systematics. So this is part of a system of organizing biological diversity that, as we'll talk about, um, in modern times has stri uh, striven to be uh, consistent with our knowledge of evolutionary history of the tree of life. So it's part of the evolution unit as well. So our learning objectives are to understand the modern taxon taxonomic system developed by Linnaeus, at least the basics of it, and how it is used today in phylogenetic systematics, and to be able to list the major taxonomic levels from most inclusive to least inclusive. So our system of taxonomy, as we mentioned earlier in the course, was developed by um, Linnaeus, who uh, lived in the 1700s. Um, it's known as scientific nomenclature, so the scientific name of a species. Species usually have common names as well. The common names are interesting, and, and a lot of people know things just by their common names. But every species out there also has a scientific nomenclature, has a genus and a species. Now, this is going to have a phylogenetic context, which means it's a context that we try to make reflect the evolutionary relationships of the organisms as we understand them. But like I've been saying, we'll talk a lot more about how to do phylogenetics later in the course. So here's some species. Um, in parentheses are their common names as they're known. Um, in italics, and that's important because it's part of how to indicate how to correctly write these um, scientific names, are their scientific nomenclature, which is a Latin binomial. It's indicated in italics, so always italicize those. And, and with word processing software, when you're writing, it's very easy to italicize things. So please do that when you're writing about sp specific species. There's two parts of it. The first one is the genus. The second one is the specific epithet or the species. So for the domestic cat, Felis catus, the genus is Felis. The specific epithet is catus. They're both italicized. The genus name is capitalized. The specific epithet is not. A genus is a more inclusive, spe uh, inclusive group than the species. The, sp the species includes all populations of the species. The genus usually includes more than one species. And sometimes the genus is, um, if it's known in the text what is being talked about, then the genus would just be capital F period, will be, will be abbreviated that way, still italicized. So F catus, if the genus has already been stated and it's clear what it is in, in whatever text you're reading. Okay, so that's a lot of Latin binomial. So for the striped skunk, it's Mephitis, Mephitis, and in that case, the genus is named after the species, and it's the same word. That happens sometimes. Also, for the European otter, that's the same case, Lutra, Lutra. For the domestic dog, it's Canis familiaris. And here's a case of two different spe species in the same genus. The wolf is Canis lupus. So the domestic dog and the wolf are in the same genus. We say they're congenerics. If two animals are in the same species, we say they're conspecifics, means same species. In this case, the domestic dog and the, and the wolf are in the same genus, canis. Those are congeneric species in the same genus. Okay? So every animal or plant or bacteria that you look at or archaea, that you look at um, every organism on earth that has been described has a taxonomy that includes all of its group and, and all of the groups that it is. And we'll talk about the, the higher groups um, in the next slide. Um, it has, a, has the Latin binomial scientific name. Okay, so here are the genera. So the plural of genus is genera. Here are the genera that are included in this picture of these carnivores. Okay, so Felis, Mephitis, 
Lutra, and Canis are all genera. And you can see a Canis, as we talked about, includes two of these species, the domestic dog and the wolf. Now, the next higher group up that contains multiple genera, so remember genera usually, but not always, contains multiple species. A family contains multiple genera. That's the next one up. So the cats are in the Felidae family, which is named after them, the cat family. And anything you think of as a cat, tigers, lions, leopards, jaguars, are in that family. The skunk and the otter turn out to be in the same family, the mustelids. That's um, distinguished in part by the, the glands that are possessed by members of that family that produce um, various odors, including the well-known one for the skunk. Um, and then the dogs are in the Canidae family that's named after the dog. So you could say that's the dog family. Okay, so that's the next group up. So, so far we've got species. We're going from least inclusive to most inclusive. We've got species, genus, family. This slide then goes on to do, to give the major groupings above this. So there's our three at the bottom, species, genus, family. And we're talking about them with respect to this um, leopard right here, Panthera partis. So that's its species name. It's in genus Panthera. It's a cat. It's in the family Felidae. The order is carnivore. And everything in that previous picture is in the car carnivore order. Those are all carnivorous mammals. So that order is the next most inclusive group. So an order contains often usually contains more than one family. The next most inclusive level is class, which will contain more than one order. The class is mammals. You know what mammals are. Mammals are a taxonomic class. Okay, so then the phylum is chordates, chord chordata. So that is all the animals with a notochord. You'll find out what that means later in the course. We'll talk about that. The next most inclusive taxonomic level is the kingdom, is the animal kingdom, animalia. And then finally the domain, and you'll hear about the three domains in an upcoming lecture. It's the domain eukarya, which is the eukaryotes. And we've talked about some differences between eukaryotes and prokaryotes, so that should be a familiar concept. This is a system developed by Linnaeus, although he didn't know some of the details, like the domains were not um, developed by him. They were developed in the, in the 20th century. Um, but these, the major levels and, and how to do it this way was developed by Linnaeus. And Linnaeus also named and described a whole bunch of well-known species from Europe and, and, and other places. And we'll have an example of that later in this lecture. Um, so for this course, we would like you to memorize the taxonomic levels in order. So if I ask you to go from most inclusive to least inclusive, most inclusive is domain, and then all the way down to species. Least inclusive to most inclusive is species all the way up to domain. So if I use the term taxa, taxa, all of these levels could be called taxa. A taxon, which is singular, taxa is plural. Taxon is defined operationally, whatever level you're interested in. So if I say, I have a bunch of species of cats. I could also say I have a bunch of taxa of cats. And you should know from the context, whatever else I say, that that's what I mean. But if I have a group of orders of insects, I could say these are taxa of insects. It really depends on what you're talking about. But those are some terms you might hear. Now, the actual names themselves have a lot of, um, it's based on Latin. This, and the suffix um, tend to be, in some cases, highly taxon specific. So for animals in orange here, the only real regularity with how the names are done is with families. The family names usually end with I-D-A-I, so something to die. And you saw that in the families that we talked about in the previous slides. There's some, a little more regularities in plants. Botany is a little more well-organized historically. Um, so those four suffix given in green there for family, order, class, and in plants it's known as division, sometimes it's known as phylum. Um, those uh, tend to be used, and the one you'll hear the most is ACI, A-C-E-A-I, which is a suffix for family. 
So if, if, if I, if I am talking about some group of plants and I say blah, 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 ACI, I'm talking about a family of plants. Um, the Asteraceae is the aster family. Um, things like sunflowers and things with um, complex, we call it composite flowers, are in the Asteraceae family. You'll hear about some, a lot of, a lot of plants later in the course, and and you'll hear about some of those families. So in species nomenclature, it goes genus name, species name, or G. Dot species name. And um, you don't use those underlines. Those are a font substitution that happened when I went from PowerPoint to um, Keynote. Here's how you would write it. That's correct. Actually, Homo sapiens or H sapiens needs to be italicized there. Okay, so the genus name first, capitalized. Each genus has one or more species. The species name second, non-capitalized. This is called a specific epithet, and you italicize both. Okay, so given that now that there's an effort to name every species that's been described, how do we organize those into a system? I've shown you this hierarchical system. How did that come to be? Well, the science of doing this is called the field of systematics. And Linnaeus was really the first one to do it. He believed that species were unchangeable, but he also believed that new species could form. So he had a lot of the concepts of evolution um, but not the whole, not the whole picture of evolution. Um, he definitely grouped things according to their morphological similarities, which is still how the major way that things are grouped today. But now we have ways using DNA and protein sequences to actually determine a, our best estimate of the phylogenetic relationships of groups of organisms and organisms to each other. That's the, that's the science of phylogenetics. And so our modern usage of taxonomy, the goal is to reflect the evolutionary relationships in the naming, in the actual tree, of the tree of life, to actually, the naming system should reflect the evolutionary relationships. So that, for example, in a genus, a genus should contain a group of close relatives, and then another genus should contain a group of close relatives and across genera, there's no close relatives that go and go across genera. All the each gen, genus would be a phylogenetic, uh, a monophyl. We call it a monophyletic group. It's a, an ancestor and all of its descendants. And you'll you'll understand more about that concept later on. And we can say that about any taxonomic group at any level, more inclusive or least inclusive. Okay, so. Going back to our slide, this is how we do it in phylogenetic systematics, how the classification system works. So because um, the domestic dog and the wolf are in the same genus, they're also each other's in the system closest relative. Okay, so um, we're drawing a phylogenetic tree backward in time. So we have, we now have five species and four what I'm calling lineages. You trace that back, the skunk and the otter are in the same family, the mustelid family. So they're the next closest relatives here, farther back in time than the relation than the common ancestor of the two canids species. Then further back in time, this is less well understood, at least it wasn't understood very well when this slide was made, which is quite a long time ago now. These will all go back evolutionarily to a common ancestor of all of the carnivores, carnivora of the order, okay? So this now gives us a phylogenetic tree that is consistent with the naming system that we have. And some of the original naming systems of Linnaeus turned out to be consistent with our modern understanding of evolutionary relationships based on both morphology and uh, DNA. Um, some of them are not, and it's the effort of a lot of what we call systematists which are the scientists who do systematics, who undertake systematics, to revise naming systems to reflect relationships, evolutionary relationships, our modern understanding. So some groups need to be revised. This particular group was pretty well understood from the morphological relationships that caused them to be originally named the way they are. So if you go 
to Wikipedia. It's a great place to look up um, any species you want. Um, the common species are all in there and sometimes with a lot of information. And generally it's pretty good information, but it's Wikipedia, so you should always um, you know, get multiple sources on this. And if you're writing a paper, Wikipedia is not going to be the best source. You want to go for scientific literature. But a lot of Wikipedia entries on species are, are well written. And they all generally have, they, they will all have the scientific classification on the right side. So here's the example of the, the nine-banded armadillo, uh, Dasypus no, novensinctus. So there are all the, the major taxonomic levels. And there are some additional levels here, like super order, which is a group of orders, but um, it's below the level of class, etc. If you go further down, it would give the genus. I only went down to family here. And um, where it has the information, it will tell you the biologist who named the family and when the family was named. So in this case, the family uh, Dasypodidae was named by Gray in 1821. Here is a plant. This is Bellus uh, perennis, which is a daisy. And um, you can see there's, uh, in plants, there's a number of unranked levels. So you dicots, you'll hear about those. Asterids is, uh, it contains several orders of which Asterales is the order. Asteraceae, I mentioned that before, is the family. And I went down to genus and species. So Bellus is the genus uh, Perennis. And this is a name, this is a species that was described and named by Linnaeus. And for those ones, and Linnaeus has special status here, they have, when the full name is given, and this doesn't, you don't have to do this in the literature, but a lot of people do in some context it's given, it's a capital letter L. When you see a capital letter L, after a scientific name, it is a species that was described and named by Linnaeus. And that's a way that we honor Linnaeus for devising this system in the first place. So after viewing this lecture and reading the assigned text, you should be able to assign to answer the following questions. Um, and there's just one page of them, just these four questions. Who founded the modern uh, system of taxonomy and when? What is the correct way to write the complete scientific name of a species? What are the major taxonomic ranks from most inclusive to least inclusive? What is the goal of phylogenetic systematics with respect to the taxonomy of organisms?